So, yep. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our community call. Um, we're going to dive straight in. Uh, the community has been asking some nice questions in the lead up to this call. We have um, recently, well, recently enough, a few months ago, announced our V2 launch, so the team is gearing up for that. Um, and yeah, some of the questions, or most of the questions are aligned in this regard. So, yeah, let's maybe just jump straight in, I guess. Um, maybe is there anything you want to say um, before we hit the questions, Brian? How are you keeping? How am I keeping? Good. Uh, we're here in ETH Prague uh, and ETH DeFi Summit and a whole bunch of the other events that are occurring around the Prague Blockchain Week, or week and a half, really. Um, a lot of side events, a lot of entertainment. <laughs> And uh, it's it's good. It's busy. There's a lot of talking, uh, and it's quite fatiguing, but it's uh, very good. And then we try and get our jobs done during the evening. So that's really where things are at at the moment. Um, just engaging, learning new stuff, talking to the right people, uh, asking the kind of questions that we've got the opportunity to ask in a face-to-face -face manner with guys who are running all the kinds of projects that uh, represent new ideas. Um, so it's something that we think is quite important, but, you know, we don't want to overkill on attending uh, conferences. Um, but really, it's getting our ear to the ground, which is just a saying to understand what's happening and <clears throat> uh, engage with the right people. So as and when we uh, partner or employ any uh, technologies or protocols or uh, products and or services out there that we know some of the people and it can fast track their conversation. So it's all part of what we need to do as a project and a protocol is get as plugged in as we can and continue to do that over time. So uh, that's it. And I must say Prague is a beautiful town. I don't know if anyone here on the line is either living or from Prague or knows Prague, but um, it's the first time I've been here and it's, it's really great. Nice. Yeah, they're always insane conferences. I've been to a few over the last few years and uh, you meet a lot of people. Um, but connections do stick. I've noticed it myself as well. If you meet the right person or a good fit for whatever, it can, can turn into something in the end. Um, I'm going to represent Fringe myself now on Saturday and Sunday. It's a two-day conference. I think it's like 8,000 people. Um, Web3 conference. And I have... 15 kilograms of fringe marketing material to bring with me that I've got printed out. So it should be quite nice. Um, looking forward to that. Flyers and business cards and t-shirts. and Yeah, hoping to meet some nice people, interesting people and spread some fringe DeFi platform awareness. Um, but yeah, always a fun time at the conferences. So awesome. Let's dive into the questions then we've been collecting them as we said the last few days um, we will start with mr logo link who's also in the call right now and he says is v2 really coming this month or later what about a new seed round with top tier vcs i think i can talk to the first one there the uh, v2 this month um it will be subject to audit so the audit process is underway um, and I don't know if anyone has been through audit processes that they're, uh, they're, they're quite trying and which is good, you know, they hold us to account. Um, but as one might appreciate, it's not possible to time box that. So as, um, as efficiently as we can work with the auditors to receive their, uh, their observations and then as efficiently as we can have our dev teams work through these and work with the auditors to properly understand these and resolve the matters uh, that will dictate the time that it takes to complete this. Um, uh, generally, it's several weeks to go through something like this. This is quite a big audit because we've got most of our V2 
smart contracts subject to audit here, which includes a lot more than just the first release of the V2 platform or V2 upgrade. Um, so the initial version of V2 will include multi-capital assets, um, atomic repayments, uh, and a whole host of things around that, our new Oracle model, um, or uh, some part of our new Oracle model, our new liquidation model. Um, and so some really good foundational engineering there. Uh, but our smart contracts include a lot more than that. In particular, it includes things such as the margin trading and the amplify, or all of our um, leverage trading capability. Uh, the smart contract order includes all of that. And we've done that particularly because we're at a point where we do want that audited all in one unit because all of this interacts quite substantially. And um, we'll then release the first release, which will include some updates to the UI as well as all of the new features for V2.0. And then following that, we'll have V2.1, which will include the things such as the margin trading and um, the amplify, all of that leverage trading side of things. Um, so this month, it is, uh, let me say it's possible. Um, that we, may, we may just bump over into next month, but that is to give everyone as much clarity as possible as to where we are where we are and what the process might be. Um, and people may be interested because I've been talking to some people here around security and audits and best practices and so forth. With regard to an audit, it's not just really one audit that occurs. It is the development team resubmits updates and fixes to the observations made by the auditors and the auditors re-audit any changes to the code in the context of the entire system. Um, so what that means is uh, it's, it's an initial primary audit and then a continued set of audits for any modifications that are made throughout that process. And those modifications are made uh, particularly in relation to addressing the matters identified by the primary or initial audit. Um, so if anyone had, has any questions around that, uh, let me know, but um, uh, because I, I think uh, I, I'd like to talk generally about quality and security in general, but uh, I'll just open it up to you guys if you have any comments or questions around that. Yeah, and if anyone does have any questions at any time, just, just type it into the Telegram and I'll read them out. Um, perfect. Yes, and then, I mean, the second part of the question, what about a new seed round with top tier VCs? I can't talk to that one. Yeah. yeah I think that's fine. Yeah. So yeah, if anyone has any questions on what Brian was just talking about, just write it in the chat. Um, yeah, move on to the next one from Boris. Uh, please reveal for us closer milestones in a roadmap four to six months. Uh, any partnerships, listings, updates, um, when do you expect the next key events in development of the project? I mean, Brian has just explained with the audit and that's kind of the current uh, thing we're waiting for and working towards, but maybe four to six months, um, Brian, I know for me, top of my head comes to is our, our new Oracle model, but um, yeah, maybe you can exp expand a bit on that. Yeah, I think this question, I'm sure in the way it is worded is far more as above and beyond just the technical aspects of the platform, um, which includes partnerships, listings, um, updates to the platform itself, uh, but a lot of the other work that goes on in the organization uh, above and beyond just the development and the protocol itself. Um, so I can particularly talk about the technology related things. And what I would say is this, now that we're in audit process and getting closer to the pointy end of, of releasing, we will be able to better estimate the delivery schedule. Now, generally, as I think people appreciate, we quote quarters and halves like um, Q1, Q2, Q3, or H1, H2, um, uh, several months out before releasing something to give people uh, as clear indication as 
uh, we possibly can to the release dates or release timeframes, because uh, calling it a date is a bit of a misnomer. But as we get closer to this, we, uh, I think, can more closely estimate dates and or weeks or beginnings or ends of months. Um, and that's the way we would like to uh, run this as we get closer. And I think that's quite important for us because it certainly keeps us on our toes. But again, I'm just, you know, I'm um, one of the nerds of the organization. So I've got a particular focus on security and just ensuring the platform is as tight as possible from a crypto economic perspective, both in terms of the, the model and the uh, protocol design, as well as the integrity of the smart contracts. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm very much focused on the schedule of delivering and setting appropriate expectations for everyone in the community and our user base and also internally and our partners. But at the end of the day, of course, my overriding priority is or the imperative is it takes as long as it is going to take and uh, it's it, um, certainly on uh, scheduling or, or forecasting individual days might be quite challenging but to the question regarding a roadmap for the next four to six months we now have a much closer idea of that and what I anticipate during this audit process is formulating a uh, a, a set of release dates or, you know, uh, I'll call them dates, but, you know, um, um, tighter timeframes or, or, or tighter, um, uh, um, yeah, tighter schedule of events for the release. Um, um, uh, because it will reflect the reality as we're getting closer to this. Uh, so we can do that. So I can't comment on that right now in terms of how I think each of these elements will be released and the dates for them. But I think um, that's something that I am formulating, further formulating, and we'll post it up on uh, our social media as we get closer. How does that sound, Eric? Yeah, that sounds, sounds good to me. <laughs> Perfect. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. Yeah, that definitely awesome. answered the question. I think uh, also, yeah, as you said, you're always focusing on the yeah the technical and the how sound the platform is, security of the platform, all the smart contracts, and yeah, we have me and Constantine and obviously our group of ambassadors that are working on uh, yeah maybe not the ambassadors so much, but in terms of partnerships and stuff like this, definitely direct members of the team, Constantine, myself, Carlos. We're always reaching out and speaking with different people, especially different teams, especially now with the launch of four new chains, ZK Sync, Arbitrum, Optimism and Polygon. That's like four new ecosystems with four new sets of opportunities in terms of listings and integrations and all this, you know. So at the moment we have the the V1 platform on ETH and um, V2 platform coming soon then after the audit. And when it's actually live as well, we'll have a lot more kind of sway i think on these new four ecosystems and um, as the platform will be live on that so that should bring it with bring with it then also new partnership opportunities and everything else in between so super excited for that because we've been working now a lot on this kind of informing of v2 v2 is coming and then moving on when the platform's actually live we can focus on trying to build up v2 tvl which i think is definitely like our main goal we want to get the platform used and yeah that's what, that's what we're going for. So I guess the, in terms of partnerships and, and stuff like this, this will come uh, as time goes on with the, the launch of, of V2. I would just add that from maybe a marketing or development side. Yes, okay. So um, I think I'll just hit, uh, list some of the things that we're, uh, that I think we can begin to sharpen up some of the timeframes, but it includes atomic repayments uh, um, and if people have questions about each of these, I mean, they have been described in some of the social media and uh, blog posts that we've made, but uh, atomic repayments, multiple lender assets, our multi-chain support, 
our um, amplifier leverage trading, our margin trade leverage trading. Um, and as I mentioned before, our liquidation model, our new liquidation model, um, and that's something we're quite excited about. It really makes the liquidation mechanism more efficient. Uh, and that's important for a lending platform uh, to best assure its stability. Also, our decentralized back end. And as we speak, I am wearing a T-shirt, some merch I got from the conference, which is the Graph uh, T-shirt, um, which I think is quite a cool one. But uh, of course, we have incorporated their technology and integrated their decentralized back end capability so that we can dispense with the need for a back end for Fringe. Um, we'll be providing support for LP token collateral um, and also our wrapped token gateway, which is to support the auto wrapping and unwrapping of ETH to and from wrapped ETH onto the platform because as people may appreciate, ETH itself is not an ERC20 token but wrapped ETH is an ERC20 token. Uh, so the platforms, and if anyone has used other platforms out there, quite often seamlessly and tra transparently, they will wrap and unwrap ETH to wrapped ETH before it can be used by the platform. And therefore it, uh, wrapped ETH is treated just like any other ERC20 on the platform. Um, we have incorporated a number of gas use optimizations on the platform. Something we noticed is because we have a very large list of collateral assets and in the future, we're going to have a larger list of capital assets, more than just the USDC that we currently support. We will have, we've got, you know, inherently various loops that occur on the uh, in the smart contracts, we've rationalized that to reduce the gas use. And so that means people are going to enjoy uh, smaller gas fees for interacting with the platform. And things like this, of course, always improve adoption and are really geared to promote adoption. Um, it's probably less of an issue on the L2 chains that we're deploying to because the gas fees are significantly lower. but uh, on Ethereum, this is still, which is, we envisage is going to still be a very, very important chain for fringe finance platform to operate upon. Um, we make that better. So that's something that we're quite happy that we were able to squeeze in for this audit. Um, and of course, user inter interface improvements, as well as the, it, just the inherent UI changes that arise from the new features that we're delivering with the platform. And also our Wallet Connect multi-SIG wallet support. Um, uh, and that's quite important for support, supporting DAO's uh, use of our platform to either take out loans against their project tokens or to use their treasury um, um, uh, yeah, take out loans essentially on the platform. Um, so, uh, and also to deposit their project tokens and earn interest on that by allowing other users to borrow those tokens. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's quite a, uh, I, I think that's the extensive list of things that we're subject to audit at the moment. Um, and also we are getting very close to being able to audit our pooled collateral capability, uh, which uh, changes the model and the way users take loans on the platform. Currently we deposit, a user can deposit collateral and take out loan against that collateral type. Um, and they can deposit other collateral and take out a loan against that other collateral. Um, and those two positions are considered separate and they will be uh, assessed for solvency on an individual position basis. Now, with our pool collateral, it allows a user to just 
just to deposit a whole range of collateral and that collateral then being used as the basis for any number of loans that they wish to take out against that pool of collateral. Um, so that improves the user experience in various respects and we're quite looking forward to delivering that capability also. Um, um, oh gosh, what else? Um, and we are, Eric will be happy to hear this, there's further and ongoing user interface improvements. So a bit of a revamp will follow on from that. So that is that is the list of items, I think, which will be included in, say, the next four to six months. And we can begin to lay out a closer and more detailed time frame uh, for the release of those. So I hope that gives a little bit further information. But, you know, it's been, it's been a whole fun process getting to this point. Uh, we're very excited. We're actually quite relieved. Um, and we'll be even more relieved, of course, once we finalise the audit process, because as I mentioned, that is quite trying and, uh, and you know, we enjoy that. That's what we're here for. But uh, there you go. So if people have got questions or uh, want to talk more around that, please just let me know. Hey, Brian, how's it going? Carlos. Apologies for the, yeah, for being late. But yeah, good to, good to hear the whole roadmap spelled up that. Um, are you guys still just like I catch up with the rhythm of the call? Are you guys going to the AMA questions? The questions some of them, the yeah. The... Okay. Yeah, I've responded to some of those AMA questions, uh, but there's come some that I cannot speak to, which is what about new seed round for top TVCs? I'm not sure if there's anything uh, particularly in mind for that. The project has funding at this point. Um, and if VCs were involved, it would really be a matter of them purchasing tokens or, uh, from the treasury. And at this point, it, um, what, like, is there a need for the project to raise funds? At this point, there isn't. Um, and it certainly, in my view, not the best time for selling tokens. And that might be something that we consider further on down the track once uh, the token is even more healthily considered by the market. Um, uh, but I don't know if anyone has anything else to comment about that, uh, feel free, but that's my view on things. Right. Yeah, I think I think that's the angle really. Like, um, that, that was an interesting question to get. Uh, I'd be interested in hearing um, why that question was asked because I don't think, um, and I've been asked this a couple of times lately, like whether we're raising more funds or whether we're continuing along that path. But really, really, right now we get funding and we are about to experience a big release. So. It's interesting people are suddenly asking asking that kind of question. Yes, interesting. I'm not sure whether I would have used the terminology experiencing a big release, but um, yeah, I'll go with that, Carlos. <laughs> well, um, yeah, we can dissect that in another occasion. Um, yeah. I am looking through the AMA questions right now. I would say, how do you yourself intend to celebrate the launch of the primary lending platform? I know as a team, we haven't had any, anything prepared to celebrate the, yeah, the anniversary, but are you doing anything special on your own side, Brian? Yes, getting a good sleep in, my friend. Oh, that's a dream. That's a dream. Yes. <laughs> yeah. How yeah, we certainly, we certainly have chewed off a lot for this release. And I think with subsequent releases, there will be a, 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 um, more atomic. Um, and the reason we wanted to do this big release is to really establish a, a, a quite a distinct 
an evolved platform above and beyond the initial version one release of Fringe Finance. So this does firmly place it into the realm of being quite a distinct offering with a unique value proposition in the marketplace. Um, so there was that intention behind it and part and parcel of that approach means it's been a lot of work and it's got a lot in it. Uh, but what we anticipate is moving forward, there'll be more atomic and more frequent releases. Right on. Yeah, I think um, another thing to say surrounding, I mean, like just the trivia fact that we're um, just one year away from the Premier Lending Platform original release is that we continue to look at these releases with a, with a critical eye, and I think it's important. Um, we, for example, just like, um, did a lot of retouches on the white paper and on our documentation, renaming the primary lending platform into fringe lending. And yeah, we continue to to look back into everything and how it plays out in the larger vision, rather than than be very attached to that. I think that's important if you want to be successful in a changing context like crypto is um th that's one thing the other is that uh, we have to also be thankful to the community because they um you know when you put it into context of, um as time it's, it's great to continue to see the same names over and over that people continue to to support as a vision for for this long one of them we even managed to turn into one of us, and I'm talking about Eric here. Eric, are you are you participating in the call? Yes, yes, yes. Well, there you are. Can you hear me? Hey, I mean, how are you celebrating the 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 anniversary of the primary lending platform? I'm wearing, my, I'm wearing my Fringe T-shirt, and I'm surrounded by different marketing materials of Fringe Finance for the conference this weekend. <laughs> I got flyers, <laughs> business cards. So that's, that's my own way of celebrating, I guess. Further promotion. Celebration through promotion. All right, yeah. Hey, Eric, do you have in, in mind a little action figure of Paul Mack or Carlos? Ah, yes, yes, yes. I will look into that. I will look into that. <laughs> I proudly put one of Carlos on my bookshelf if uh, that ever came to fruition. Nice. I have never met him in person, but I reckon Constantine must have pretty long limbs. So maybe maybe that would make for a good action figure. Yeah. Yes. I've seen him. I've seen him in real life. He does exist. Uh, I think at, All we'll, right. we'll go for 1 million, 1 million TVL, and then I'll get on to the action figures. There we go. Yep. Yep. Uh, did you guys answer the question about multi-chain CEO? Not yet, so go ahead and read it. The only thing is for on me, All uh, right. just so you know, maybe it's just my end, the mic quality is a bit, it's kind of like, it kind of sounds like bad connection, but I asked in the chat and everyone else said it's fine, but just so you have it in mind for the recording, but that could just be my computer, just to let you know. I didn't understand that. What was it? Just so on my end, your mic sounds a bit uh, like it's bad connection or something. But I think it could also be my end. Oh, just to let you know. So. I'm talking from my phone, so probably. Are you also hearing me? With yeah, uh, am I also breaking up for you, Ryan? Uh, you are, yeah, slightly. Okay, I'll I'll move to my laptop there. Now I'll if you want to read the question while I do that, Eric. Yeah, sounds good. So. Yep. So yeah, regarding what happened with multi-chain CEO last week. Um, are you aware of what happened, uh, Brian? Or should I explain it? Oh no, I'm not. So um, yeah. I, I hate to. I had to proclaim ignorance on some of this stuff because you know we're trying to keep across everything, but sure. uh, I've just kind of been traveling and in in conference. Yeah. So basically, basically just TLDR, uh, multi-chain, very very big and famous bridge. Their CEO has is I don't know. 
but I expected it gone missing, not responsive, um, for whatever reason, no contact anymore. And um, the reason doesn't matter. Uh, and then the question would be regarding what happened with multi chain CEO last week that he just disappeared, not contactable. Therefore, he had like all the like access codes for some bridges or some seed phrases or server access, which they can't get a hold of now. So it's jeopardized the project in a little bit. So that the question would be. Yep. Um, so what happened with the multi-chain CEO last week? We can definitely see why getting decentralized is important. But in the meantime, is there any concern with the project moving forward if Paul O'Brien gets scooped up by totalitarian regime or bad actors for working on highly disruptive tech? Paul can only sail international waters on his yacht for so long. And Brian uh, can't work from one undisclosed location after another forever. <laughs> 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 Okay, okay, so um, uh, I don't know if people are familiar with the Star of Texas. Just come and try and take it, uh, T-shirt or meme. But um, yeah, they, they can come and try and do that. But at the moment, I'm moving around, so I'm not really in one spot. I don't think a platform as that, such as ours represents or as something that any authority is going to focus on at the moment. Uh, and we've got time to continue to decentralize. Uh, just a small comment on bridges. And I think there is another AMA question regarding uh, fringe token liquidity on, let me just have a look at it, on QuickSwap, which is Polygon, uh, the ZK EVM. Uh, and I'll get to the point and why that's relevant. Um, bridges by and large have centralized aspects to them where there's quite a lot of trust required of the uh, pool of funds that is held on the bridge. Um, I, I think listeners here may note that we currently do not support, though we support multi-chain or we will, we're imminently releasing our multi-chain support, we currently do not support cross-chain support, um, sending assets and or holding them uh, or being able to borrow assets across chain. Um, and there's a very good reason for that is because, you know, in my humble opinion, there has just been quite a number of dumpster fires around bridges and there is some evolution that needs to occur on bridges. And uh, quite potentially, we will be looking at uh, any features or capability we can deliver that may employ bridges, but in a transient manner, rather than relying upon the bridge holding assets for a long period of time. Uh, just to mitigate the kinds of risks that is, you know, potentially occurring here with multi-chain, um, because that's something that we've always had an eye on, that, excuse me, <laughs> that um, bridges represent Anyway, um, back to, I think, another AMA question that's related to all of this, which is the one about fringe, um, uh, fringe token on QuickSwap and Polygon ZK EVM. Um, there, there's a couple of things. To wrap a token, to wrap our token from the Ethereum chain so that it can be manifest on another chain requires a bridge. Um, and, you know, it has its attendant issues, uh, as I just mentioned, but also there are some other issues that may come into play here or do come into play, which is liquidity. Um, when, uh, if there is a DEX that trades that token on that, alternate chain, then that DEX or that market is at greater risk or subject to greater risk of market manipulation. Um, and then that creates arbitration of, uh, um, um, uh, yeah, arb opportunities between the two chains and it distorts the market uh, for fringe. So what we anticipate, and I think this has been mentioned maybe once or twice already on some of the community chats, is one day 
when friend token has greater liquidity uh, and greater market cap, that may be something that we can look at. But for the time being, because of the fairly limited liquidity that it would represent, if there were markets springing up for that in other trading venues, that represents a little bit of a risk for the stability of the price of that token, especially given uh, or, or particularly because, as I mentioned, there is greater risk of market manipulation. So I hope that addresses that question. Um, so in short, it is at the moment, no, we're not looking to list friend token on QuickSwap. Um, but uh, as things progress, given those parameters or considerations that I mentioned, it may be something that is um, uh, progressed further later on down the track. Hey guys, uh, you should be able to hear me with a lot better quality now. Is that the case? Yes. Yep. All right, great. Uh, just interjecting back on the multi-chain CEO thing, and uh, feel free to contradict me if there is new information that has come to light uh, recently about this. But also, I'm surprised that the multi-chain community at large are assuming that this is a case of a sensor chip or something related, when it, from my perspective, it is not fully clear whether this could be also a case of them pulling the rock from other people, like this particular individual doing so. Uh, as far as I know, that was still unconfirmed, but given my experience in crypto, that seemed a lot more likely. So, yeah, I, I don't know if sensor questions apply to us, really. It, it will come down to, to very specific regulations, but you would also want to assume that if your authorities will go after players in the DeFi industry, which as far as I know, they haven't yet, they haven't attacked any, any particular protocol yet, and that might be because unlike other projects that have been classified as securities uh, or, you know, uh, accused of similar, similar, of breaking the law in a similar way, DeFi protocols do present a pretty much immediate utility to the public. So that might be partly, partly a reason why it would be Heard by authorities, or they're trying to figure out a way to deal with us directly. So I wouldn't say there is any any fear of DeFi itself being attacked. And if that came to be, bridge finance at cities would not be a priority on those lists. Anything to that from either of you? It's not real good audio on your end, Carlos. So some of that I missed. Oh, if, there was a, if there was a question, a specific question, uh, uh, maybe you can uh, just uh, summarize it. Just and at the end, you could have yeah. Carlos, just yeah. But I just I just realized that I was talking onto the wrong microphone, <laughs> although I have properly connected yeah. it. That this should be a lot better, is it now? Yep. Yeah. Okay. It only took like half an hour to solve this. Um, yeah, no, just uh, just curious on on your own thoughts, or if any of you has any their information on whether this is an individual running away or really a case of censorship. That's a really interesting question. Uh, I attended a DAO um, uh, a, a, a DAO. Um, hackathon this week and these were matters that came up in that session okay so uh the world is scrambling around at the moment concerned about regulation and people uh being uh, uh, having authorities press them for uh um um legal compliant, legal inverted commas compliance uh, around their token and the use of the token, et cetera, et cetera. My view is this, that projects and DAOs do need to move to a more pseudonymous and 
a pseudonymous world so that the network state can be more fully realized. Now, the network state is a notion of an ecosystem and an economy which is operating in such a manner so it's not tied to any nation state jurisdiction. Um, even in the Tao world, I believe there is not an advanced set of conceptualizations of this. And in fact, uh, I'm spending some time working on some solutions to this to put in place some uh, concrete implementations of what is closer to the the notion and the ideal of what the network state needs to embrace and move toward. So um, the long and the short of that is through greater pseudonymity, actors and participants within projects can operate. And so long as those pro projects don't have need to interact with the traditional financial system, then they can operate wholly on chain and wholly un separate from the nation state and any inverted commas regulations that apply to entities within the nation states. Um, uh, you know, I could talk for a long time around this. In fact, we put together a uh, uh, our submission in the hackathon in the Dow Hackathon won a prize. So we're quite happy about that. Uh, oh, congratulations. Been, yeah, yeah. We think we've been thinking long and hard about this because a direct application of this is going to be the movement or transition of the fringe project to a DAO. Um, uh, and we've got certain DAO models in place. And one thing that was loud and clear from other participants in the DAO uh, conference was that herding a thousand governance token holders tends to be very ineffective, inefficient, and the participation by those token holders is not great. And something that Paul has mentioned before is a delegated model where delegates uh, act, if you like, as representatives of the token holders. And so the token holders can vote out those delegates, uh, um, but the delegates have good ability to direct and drive the delivery of the project. Um, and they're, they're kinds of models that have existed for quite some time and have been successful. Uh, so the shape and form of fringe will very likely be that kind of approach. So people certainly do have the ability to swap out delegates, uh, but the delegates will be uh, very much, you know, chosen because of their DNA uh, to drive aspects of the project, whatever discipline is required to uh, assemble that. So there will be a fairly tight team will be pseudonymous as much as possible and um and you know so a practical aspect of that is the names and individuals that we're seeing here may be replaced by um pseudonymous actors but they may in fact be some of the same exact same people i mean you know just for um for the record i'm not going anywhere and uh in whatever shape or form I appear, I'm still going to be involved with this project because, you know, I've got a lot involved in this project and uh, um, and it's quite important because my view is our job is to deliver this stuff that enables the network nation um, and delivers value and that really differentiates from the competition out there. And I mean that quite broadly, which includes competition of the traditional financial systems um, and to really build capability and promote adoption, both from within the De DeFi or the crypto space, but also um, uh, to onboard, onboard traditional financial people. And there's been some really interesting discussions on that matter 
here in the conference in Prague this week. But, you know, they're things that I think as we form and shape those over time, there'll be things that we discuss more openly with the community uh, as we uh, formulate how we're going to deliver some of this stuff um, and, you know, really assess what we should deliver and um, the merits of uh, uh, some of the interesting ideas that are out there. Anyway, I probably have gone on and slightly off track, but um, that's a little bit about some of the musings around DAOs and about the, I think, Carlos, you mentioned the risks or fears people have out there regarding regulation. Uh, my view is we need to more firmly uh, carve the right path because there's two types of DeFi. One is KYC DeFi, which is not DeFi, <laughs> and the other is DeFi. And again, something I've mentioned probably many, many times to people who um, will find it a bit repetitive is the core value proposition of DeFi is its censorship resistance, its permissionlessness, um, and uh, we just need to continue to pursue that uh, with single-minded clarity. I just have like 40 follow-up questions that I've been typing down here uh, because I'm really interested in the stuff you're talking about. Um, so I might just take us in a long ass tangent, but uh, first one would be um, the quickest one. Uh, what was your project for the hackathon about? What was it uh, about this uh, delegated voting for, for DAOs or was it around something else? Oh, okay. It's kind of orthogonal to everything here at Fringe, but um, it's a very small part of something, uh, a greater concept that I have in mind uh, because I didn't want to give the greater concept away. So this was a very, very tiny side aspect to this greater concept and it was you know i won't go on in any great detail but it is a milestone dow so that vcs and funders <clears throat> can uh, um, engage with projects via this milestone dow and the milestone dow will well the problem being solved is vcs are fast talking deal makers and they're very interested in upfront assessing projects and then making the deal. <clears throat> and then a, project's, a project gets kicked off, it gets funded, um, and that funding occurs over a period of years and they receive progressive funding based on milestones achieved by the project. Now, the Milestone DAO automates some of that process, uh, both through smart contracts on chain work Plus also the milestone DAO will have human assessment of some aspects of milestone evidence, which is provided by projects so they can submit that. And there'll be, as I mentioned, the off-chain aspect of that and sometimes an, um, an on-chain aspect of that. And that will then allow the milestone DAO to uh, provide milestone funding to those projects to keep them going. So the venture capitalists can continue to focus on what they do, which is striking new deals rather than ongoing administration of their funds and the distribution of those funds. Uh, so that is that was what we won the prize for. So we're quite happy about that. Um, but, you know, again, we just thought we would tailor some small aspect of this more overarching concept uh, and just see how it went and it was relatively well received so um yeah that was a whole bunch of fun but anyway you know i i think the key thing out of all of this is with fringe and you know people probably get sick of us hearing get, get sick of hearing about us talk about this we're very much focused on the decentralized aspect of it but uh that really just underlies uh uh, using these value propositions to attract user base and to deliver good product. And we believe, you know, if we get good product and our marketing team is working hard, uh, then the uh, users will come. That is really cool. I think um, 
uh, I'm pretty interested in concepts like uh, retroactive funding for public goods, like stuff that Gitcoin does to, you know, to reward projects after they have built something to try and break away from the traditional uh, VC or pre-sale model for crypto projects. Also, because there is some, there is some important but boring or unsexual aspects of blockchain public goods that people are not that interested in funding, but that is nonetheless, again, important for the decentralization of the space. So I think this is pretty cool. Like you can pretty much work this concept into something like, into something like that, into a retroactive funding for public goods, into something like the Gitcoin collective. Uh, yeah, I like the idea. Um, and that ties very nicely into other stuff that you spoke about, such as a delegated model for voting and for the DAO. I think that would work really well for Fringe because in my experience, being part of a DAO day and night, uh, what can happen with DAOs sometimes is that because if the project is going well and if progress is sufficient, then the DAO turns into basically a part-time job for every one of their members and it becomes very time consuming and that makes most people lose interest. Um, the delegated model is, yeah, it is pretty, it's pretty genuine and Essos as a, is a layer one blockchain that has been experimenting with that for a while and it has had good results for them when it comes to governance. I will not speak to the results of the overall test project, but at, at least on the, the governance side, they seem to have that pretty tied down. So yeah, I'm interested in how do you envision this uh, the application of this concept into into fringe. Uh, can I ask you to just summarize the thing that you are curious about us uh, uh, fringe um, right. integrating? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I always ask these very open questions. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think like the question would be. Uh, how do you envision Fringe uh, applying something like delegated voting? Uh, as in, what are the stages that you think this will occur? Oh, okay. So um, with delegated voting, rather than every single matter that the DAO participates in or involves itself with being open to vote, by a myriad of voters, uh, voters will by and large have the ability to vote in and out the board or, you know, the, the, the delegates. Um, but the delegates will drive the project and they'll be working full time on the project or fully focused to the project. So as you mentioned, it avoids some of the pitfalls of a lot of people having only a little bit of skin in the game uh, and not fully and or adequately focused on the project. So this delegate model means that there are a core group that are working together closely and they operate effectively and the um, governance token holders can assess the effectiveness of that delegate group according to the timely delivery of uh a, a, a timely delivery the delivery in appropriate schedule and quality and um capability of the delegate team so that's the way i see it operating so the delegate will really push forward on things and they'll have general allocation of funding from the greater community but then the greater community on a less frequent basis will be able to, well, will be able to vote in and out delegates, but the governance token holder community won't necessarily be engaged for every single decision made by the DAO. 
All right. Um, I, I think I, I was kind of like referring, but it's good that you break down the concept because there might be people that are not that familiar with delegation for voting. I was kind of referring more to the um, to the stages of applying these into the DAO. So, for example, uh, I reckon like one of the um, bigger steps the DAO itself would need to take uh, would be to establish a framework for for voting and forums where proposals are made and maybe even the creation of a DAO treasury to, to facilitate the DAO paying for its own activities and I see that as being contingent to first of all the the project generating revenue uh, so that we can move away from a model where a private entity is funding development of fringe to a model where the DAO is is funding it. So that that paints a picture that full decentralization might be a bit far away, but I was curious about what other considerations or stages or milestones, if you want to call it that, you see for for decentralization, for the DAO, and for delegated voting? Um, okay. Uh, I think something very important to keep in mind is because a delegated model uh, is far preferable to execute a the, 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 the imperative of the organization, and I'm just calling the fringe project an organization rather than a DAO, because uh, DAO has certain definition that I think more generally can be encompassed in the notion of an organization. Okay, so what are some of the milestones? Well, um, it isn't necessarily just decentralized because there is going to be a, a delegate model, but decentralized, it not being decentralized does not mean that it is any more censorable than uh, any um, than a fully distributed DAO. It's just for practical purposes more efficient to operate in that manner. And you know, this is something to be considered. These are just some formula, some formative ideas, um, because. Uh, one of my key considerations is whatever structure arises from this will be one that is designed for success rather than encountering the kind of pitfalls that exist with many other DAOs. Um, some previous DAOs that I've been involved in are in some of the steps to establish uh, and, and progress towards that DAO have been appropriate tooling, both from the voting and the publication and the um, forums that are necessary to ensure that people have the ability to provide input and have visibility of the activities of the DAO. And that, for example, will be something like a Discord sorry, um, a discourse server, um, uh, because that really lends itself to uh, those kinds of forums and the kind of interaction required there. Uh, it will be a few other pieces of tooling around uh, treasury management and uh, Gnosis is uh, some of the tooling around there are good, particularly Gnosis Safe and the multi-sig and trust minimized setups that can be established that way. Um, there are some of the things. Um, at, at this point, Carlos, there's, or, you know, community, there is no defined schedule for that, but that's something that we will begin to cast our mind to uh, as we get more and more capable product out there and we move and we need to move to a more, um, let's say robust or resilient organizational model because um, uh, yeah, the roadmap is to move to that DAO model and that is very much the way 
uh, we're intending to do this. And it's just a matter of focus and us getting over the various uh, mountains that we're climbing at the moment, getting those out of the way. And as discussed earlier on in this session, there's quite a lot being delivered at the moment. And that represents quite a good opportunity to have a good lie down, a good sleep in for a day or two before we embark upon the rest of the stuff, which includes the transition to a DAO. I was just talking to a muted microphone. Cool. Yeah, no, I, I really like your musings on on these on these topics because I have never actually discussed the network state with anyone, although I'm pretty familiar with the concept um, that, well, I, I think Balaji was the first one to float to the public, and Balaji lately at least to me, it seems a little bit, and we're going way off topic of the fringe AMA here, but I reckon this might be of some interest to people still. Uh, it seems like he's been a little bit out of touch with the real world, with what with the 90 days dollar collapse bet and all, although there is still some true to him sounding the alarm that the US dollar might enter a period of suffering, uh, which still seems to be like a more nuanced topic than what it's being painted as. But yeah, I mean, I, I found this concept and the person that brought it to, to light extremely fascinating. There have already been some experiments played out in the real world around what would a physical manifestation of a network state be like? And you mentioned uh, it being fully disconnected from traditional finance. So do you think that's doable at all? Do you think uh, we can start, we're at a stage where we can have purely crypto entities that are not tied down to fiat on ramps and off ramps as which have been on, up until now? Uh, very important players of the ecosystem okay well we're talking quite generally now yes i think that will happen and it's happening in some places now and that's on a oh yeah we've, we've, we've gone basis. full <laughs> we've been yeah, yeah. Gone full crazy no, talk at this point <laughs> i won't spend a lot of time talking about this but um um uh Bukele in um uh, what jurisdictions at the moment are considering um, further or adopting Bitcoin as uh, legal tender? I mean, uh, above and beyond El Salvador, for example, being the first jurisdiction. And that, well, you know, hopefully with some of the smaller states around, uh, will usher in a new era of various nation states adopting bitcoin um i think without a doubt oh gosh <laughs> you know i could talk about this stuff for hours and it's probably quite off topic here so we might leave that for another chat if people want to uh open up a more general discussion on the uh the telegram chat we can speak more generally but if there's other stuff particular to fringe i think people are interested in that on this call we can um uh, uh, address those and we'll close out this call based on that. Yeah, we've been... All right, yeah, no, no one has complained. No one has complained yet about us going wildly off topic. So I reckon people must be yeah. enjoying this to an extent. Uh, what were you going to say there, Eric? Yeah, no, I was just going to say, like, we have actually, even before we drifted onto a great topic, we um, did cover actually most of the questions anyway. I'm just having one last look. Um, yeah, just one final question. Maybe that was actually the first one, and it's also from somebody called Eric, so I'm just going to read it out. Um, what next chain uh, to be put on? Oh, no, actually, yeah. Do we need any audits to deploy on the other chains, basically, was the question, TL, your version of the question. Uh, short answer, no. It's all EVM compatible. There's no code change for us to deploy on those platforms. But, of course, there's a lot of front-end linking between those. Yeah. Uh, uh, between those um, deployments, 
Uh, so there's some smarts on the front end that just allow you to pop up a selector so you can select your chain. Uh, and it's all quite visually appealing. You know, you get a picture of the logo of the chain and you just press it and hey presto, you're connected and operating on that separate chain. Yeah, um, would, would you like to speak a little bit uh, to the um, to why there are still challenges uh, in porting a project into a different EVM compatible chain? Because I, I mean, to some people, it might seem like it's just a matter of basically copy pasting, and it would be good to to talk a little bit about the nuances that go into that. Yep. Okay. In short, it is because the L2 um, give a really good crack. They have a really good try at making their platform EVM compatible, but it's quite complex to build a whole new engine that can support uh, Ethereum, that can act as an Ethereum virtual machine. Uh, so they get some things wrong. And that is something we experienced with ZK Sync. They had to have their core dev team fix some stuff on their chain. And they made two uh, uh, product releases to get, uh, get a fix in for us. By no means is this a criticism of ZK Sync. My gosh, what they're doing is incredible. Um, but that is just, in short, some of the considerations because we deployed and deployed and deployed and tested and were hitting brick walls left, right and center with ZK Sync. Uh, and we uh, just had to continue to increase our engagement with their teams to really pin down exactly where things were happening. and. We, Fringe Finance, were not the only ones experiencing these matters, but we were pushing and trying to um, uh, um, trying to escort these through with the ZK Sync team and providing the right information to help them resolve things. So uh, they do amazing jobs, but the reality is this is all complex technology and there are a number of wrinkles that they need to iron out or projects L2s in general that do need to iron out so that these uh, EVM apps can be ported without modification across the EVM L2 chain suite. Curious because I mean, I don't think I've ever heard you say that, but like, what do you, what do you like the most about what CKE Sync is doing? You just said like what they're doing is amazing. So yeah, what are what's exciting you about that? Yeah, yeah. Well, what I think is amazing is the fact you we've got cross-chain zero knowledge proof of uh, value transfer, so that it does away with their previous model of uh, optimistic value transfer, which requires a whole different setup. It requires sentinels to look at. Uh, whether uh, transactions are true or not, um, and time delays. And then that then brings in other potential or other actors to the platform, which gives instant finality, if you like, but at a cost because they'll fund that and they take on the risk of that transaction not being uh, uh, ultimately confirmed after the uh, waiting period. So I think what ZK Sync is doing amazing in that respect. I mean, and, and presumably there'll be some further developments to provide privacy uh, or zero knowledge on processing and some of the transaction uh, contents, like the value transfer and values and so forth and the addresses. I'm not quite sure what their plans are there. I'd like to look at it more closely, uh, but I think what they've done to date is fantastic. and. And it's really fast. It's, you know, it's um, so pleasant to use. Cool. Yeah, uh, I've been playing with Tenet on CK Sync, and I know it's not the same thing. I have not yet played with CK Sync's mainnet, but it's pretty fast, right? Um, it, it, it's really nice to see that we've come to a place where we have like these roll-ups that inherit the security for 
their main chain while still being blessingly fast, really cheap. I really, I really hope the CK thing has a long and happy future. And yeah, uh, we can start finishing the call if there are no follow-ups. If people want to drop uh, more questions onto the uh, chat, so we can quickly touch on them before ending the call. That'd be great. Or if someone wants to come in and say something, that'd be great. I'm reading another question by Quinn, and that is, Gerayo is a bit remote for many investors. Is there any plans of listing at other exchanges, even if not the mainstream ones like Binance? I would just say that listing in exchange is a very expensive process. Um, it's a lot of time just not worth it. I, I think if Fringe goes in the direction of trying to facilitate more people to purchase tokens, that would more likely be true. Decentralized exchanges. So I, I hope that answers your question. And there are internal talks about liquidity for the for the project here and there. But yeah, it's a, it's a bit hard to keep track of all the things that need to be done. Uh, definitely, though, expect uh, changes in that regard to come from the decentralized version rather than the centralized one. Yes. Okay. If people were interested in some of the other things that we're talking about here also, um, here's a couple of books that might be worthwhile. First of all, The Network State. And you can find that on Balajai Srinivasan's website, and it's called the networkstate.com, I think it is, I'm not sure, but or dot org, but the network state. That's a really good one. Um, it's silent on a couple of things that I think are crucial for the network state to really uh, be fully realized. Um, and we're working on some solutions in that space. But uh, another good book is The Sovereign Individual. Uh, and another good book, if, uh, yeah, it's kind of out there, it's called Chaos Theory. Um, and that is about um, uh, anarcho-capitalism, but chaos and, and anarchy is not about chaos. It's being without a leader and uh, a society operating in such a way that they have agreements and contracts with one another. And there's insurance that upholds that and enables all of that. Uh, and it just quite interestingly talks about a number of models around that. So they're excellent uh, books for food for thought. Anyway, that's today's re reading list. Uh, that's relevant to some of the things we touched on today. Yeah, I can really recommend the network states. Pretty, pretty good read, pretty good read. And uh, yeah, I mean, we've gone over time for the call. So thank you all for your time and for still listening and for your interest in fringe finance. Brian, Eric, always a pleasure, guys. Yeah, thanks everyone for listening. Take it easy. Uh, if there's any further discussion that people want to have, uh, stick it on to our Telegram group and I should be able to make some time to have a look around at that at the moment. But yeah, things are quite busy. But um, I'm sure if there are particular points, the guys can bounce it across to me. Okay, cheers, everyone. Cheers. Everyone. Right on. Cheers. Take care. Bye-bye.